Well, a few minutes ago, John and I spent a couple of minutes with Senator John Thune, Republican of South Dakota. Here's some of that conversation. Senator Thune, thanks for joining us. We heard from President Obama last night in the Oval Office, and he outlined a plan to, to take this crisis and really move beyond that and, and establish a, a program for energy independence, for climate change. I want to ask you, did, did that speech change anything about the politics around this? And what, what do you think the prospects are for sweeping energy and, and climate legislation this year? If it were done the right way, I think there'd be some support for, uh, you know, some energy legislation to move through Congress this year. Uh, my guess is the problem, and the president wasn't real specific in this regard uh, about exactly what he would propose, is when the legislation starts to move on Capitol Hill, it's going to be along the lines of a Kerry Lieberman or a Waxman Markey, which are cap and trade legislation, and which would impose huge energy taxes. And that's not something I don't think any Republican or very few Republicans would be for. I think anything that is that sort of uh, top uh, you know, top-down approach, that sort of heavy on mandates is going to be very problematic for uh, the president to get through. But there would be support for an energy policy that includes incentives for the renewable forms of energy. And I think they could move an energy policy if they structured it the right way. But it would involve, you know, reaching out right. to Republicans and trying to get uh, something that Republicans would vote for. Well, the other thing is it's just legislative gridlock in the Senate. I mean, you guys uh, right now are unable to pass an extension of unemployment benefits, popular uh, 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 tax provisions that, that, that are expiring. Um, I mean, what, what, what do you see happening right now? I mean, we, we are now 14 days in to the expiration of unemployment benefits, and there's been very little outcry compared to what we saw the last time they expired. What, what's going on? I think right now what you're seeing is a growing concern, uh, not just among uh, Republicans have always been there, but among Democrats in both the House and the Senate about this, uh, you know, this increasing amount of federal debt, the amount of spending, uh, the amount of borrowing, the deficits year over year that, that are being created here. And there's less and less of an appetite to do things now that are going to involve uh, you know, spending money that's not paid for, that's not offset. So, you know, my view is that uh, there are things that can get done, but they're going to have to be ways proposed to pay for it. And that's kind of the, the difference of opinion that we have about the legislation that's on the floor in the Senate right now. But my sense is, too, that the president has sort of reached the limits in terms of his ability to influence Democrats on Capitol Hill. I think congressional Democrats are concluding that their electoral prospects are very much in jeopardy if they continue to vote for and support uh, spending that's not paid for and adding more and more to the federal debt. Now you have your own proposal for tax extenders, uh, that, uh, a proposal that would actually cut the deficit uh, according to your numbers. Uh, some groups have looked at this, including some liberal groups, and said this would mandate really a government shutdown by the end of the year. Do you agree with that analysis? Are you concerned about what it would mean to actually do these cuts at the same time you're extending the tax benefits? No, I think what they're doing is they're confusing budget authority and outlays, and that's a very different thing. Uh, what my amendment would do, it would reduce spending this year, and when I say spending outlays by about 2%, but that's manageable. I don't think any federal agency couldn't come up with a way in which to shave a 2% out of their budget this year. Uh, a lot of the reductions in spending would occur in out years in budget authority, and of course there's an opportunity to plan for that. So I think that's what we're operating on is what the Congressional Budget Office is saying, and that's what the CBO is saying. Uh, and so uh, some of these groups that are coming up with these uh, various analyses, I think are not consistent with what certainly what the CBO is saying and I think also confusing budget authority and outlays. Now we also have the, the big war supplemental uh, 33 billion dollars for Afghanistan Iraq. Uh, it, it also seems to be facing some real opposition from the Democrats. Will you and will the Republicans uh, stand with the president to get that war supplemental passed? We will if the president would focus it and if the, if the Democrats here in Congress would focus it really on the emergency funding for Iraq and Afghanistan. I think that the problem, again, is all the other things that get added on to these war supplementals and, and, and the fact that it's not paid for. Uh, there are Republicans are increasingly, I think, dug in on the issue of making sure that uh, new spending is, is offset, or at least Do, wait, quite offset. Excuse me, Senator, does that include the, the, the war funding? I mean, will you insist that every penny of that money for Afghanistan is offset by cuts elsewhere? I don't think that that's necessarily a 
consensus position even among Republicans. Republicans in the past have viewed Iraq and Afghanistan and the war effort as something that truly is an emergency. Although it's hard to say now that we don't know what these costs are going to be. Yeah, nine frankly, years in, right. frankly, I think that uh, there is even a growing consensus among Republicans that we need to start budgeting for this. We need to start figuring out how to pay for it. And, and I think that's kind of the majority view among Republicans now. Um, but I wouldn't say it's a unanimous view. I think that the question of whether or not you have to pay for the Iraq and Afghanistan funding component of that overall supplemental bill that passed in the Senate is uh, that's an open question. So you do want to see offsets, though. We, we do want to, we particularly want to offset everything that's not war funding, mm -hmm. but there, there are people, we've got a lot of Republicans who believe that even the war funding now ought to be offset and ought to be budgeted for. Okay, two, two, two quick questions on politics before we let you go. Where are we on the Thune 2012 uh, uh, talk? <laughs> well, at the moment, we aren't anywhere on that. But, uh, <laughs> Nowhere. We are focused on 2010. Haven't you guys oh, heard? Oh, we heard, we heard you, you've, got a, you've got a real squeaker. But it, it, <laughs> fair yeah. to say, you'll, if you were to become president, you, that you'd do your first Oval Office address in less than 18 months into, into your term? Well, I think that waiting this long, and, and it took a, a crisis to do that, the president, I think right now, is feeling a lot of pressure, obviously, politically. And his people thought they needed to get him out there, get him in front of the American public on this. But it probably should have happened a lot earlier. <laughs> okay, and, we're out of time. Uh, Republicans have a chance of beating uh, her Seth out there, that House race in South Dakota? I think it's going to be a very competitive race. Uh, she she's going to have a is going to be a competitive campaign. There's a great Republican nominee out there, and if for the first time I think in a long time in South Dakota, you're going to have a, a House race to watch, and maybe not a Senate race. No, maybe not. Uh, your, your preference on that one, Senator John Thune, Republican of South Dakota. Thank you for being here. Appreciate thanks, it. Senator. Thanks, John. Thanks, Rick.